Jonathan, thank you very much for the introduction. We were watching carefully for your words. We saw that David got um, his in first this time, if I may say. Uh, the big debate, to brand or not to brand, um, it's my pleasure to be the warm-up guy for an illustrious panel that is sitting in front of me here, and they'll be coming onto the stage after I've shared some information with you. But we're looking at the continued relevance of the hotel brand and what's going to inform our debate. Well, I'm going to start by looking at the explosion of the number of brands that are available. And then we'll look through uh, to remind ourselves about the role of brands and then conclude on wh where are the brands that are out there, both hotel brands and what I'm going to call distribution brands, the OTAs and the home share sites. Uh, I should add that uh, all the slides will be available uh, after the event, so if anything is too small to see or catches your attention, you will be able to download it later on. Um, I think we'd like to start just with a, a little bit of an exploration, and I'm going to play a small game with you. It's something to, yeah, just to get us all going here, warm ourselves up, uh, and invite you all to participate in this. Um, let's just have a look at some of these brands. Um, so, uh, you will, of course, recognize these, won't you? Uh, number one, uh, a lifestyle select brand, a select service concept with a forward-thinking focus on design and detail, the customer experience, and recognition of the increasingly important role that technology plays in facilitating everyday life. Uh, number two, uh, created for, I hope you're putting your answers down, created for multi-blenders of 24-7 lifestyles, seeking a select service hotel that will allow them to balance work and play. This is a new generation of hotels that offers casual hospitality in a smartly designed, high-tech and modern environment. The brand exclusively offers food and beverage options freshly prepared 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and our unique gallery host model allows hosts to reflect our guests by being multi-blenders themselves. Uh, number three, catch the spirit. Welcome to this, a place that embraces vibrant simplicity and is fun and engaging. We stand for the love of simplicity. We embrace the human spirit. And you can see it's all back to basics experience with soul. Number four, uh, here we serve the curious people who are inspired by new places, new people, and new ideas. To manage this one, place it in the portfolio. Uh, start with an easy one. Oh, autograph collection. Marriott, well done. I mean, we have, we have a panelist. I knew Tim was going to shout it out. Uh, the Ascend Hotel Collection. Choice, no. Wyndham. Uh, canopy. Ooh, that's better, yes. Uh, tribute portfolio. Vibe. Yeah, okay, we did a little better on that second game. Um, but, you know, this is uh, uh, well, not really exactly up to speed ourselves. I know you're trying to dim me out as I uh, drew attention uh, to this. But if we don't know the brands, how are the consumers going to know them? Okay, I am being unfair. I do know that. Um, but we have to sort of ask ourselves what it is we're doing. I want to provide some context. 
We talk about brand proliferation. I'll give you brand proliferation. Uh, let's look at Unilever. Unilever has over 400 brands. Uh, just 15 of them are billion dollar blockbusters. Dove, Hellman's, Knorr, Lynx. I say Lynx, but actually in most of the world it's called Axe, uh, Flora, and Lux. But some are either relatively small or in certain local markets only. Does that sound familiar at all? I mean, who here is familiar with Zendium toothpaste in Central and Eastern Europe? Slots mustard in Sweden, and the one I particularly like, Amino dehydrated soup in Poland. Um, brands for particular markets and places is an established principle. So brand proliferation, how many target markets are there? Well, with sophisticated market segmentation, brands must adapt and evolve. Uh, this rather fine vehicle, the Morris Mini Minor, as it was introduced in 1959, 850cc engine, one model, actually strangely, two brands. It was also available until 1962, I didn't know this, I looked it up, uh, as the Austin 7, uh, a hark back to a previous brand in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, it came with a few optional extras, seat belts, door mirrors, heater, and a radio. Um, that is a brand that has grown and evolved. The Mini range in 2017 has more than 35 different models. The entry level model is at just, without any extras, is half the price of the most expensive model. So there's a massive range with the brand. So I think there are key lessons here we can see from other sectors about the need for brand evolution and also the opportunities that exist for brand extension. Also, just taking this example here, I wonder, are we muddling brand with other things as well? Because is brand, to some extent, becoming model or product? Yes, there is a proliferation of what we call brands, but there's clearly consolidation amongst the brand owners who thus build their marketing strength. Few of the new brands, especially the soft conversion brands, will become well-known in their own right but they have massive potential audience reach through membership of the umbrella or mother brand distribution systems, much as Unilever, as a brand wholesaler, can achieve. And so with loyalty, or as my colleague James Bland says, frequency programs, uh, membership, uh, or guests going to brand.com, the likes of Autograph, Ascend, and Curio, will deliver for their property owners the benefits of brand affiliation, namely increased volumes and a price premium. Well, that's what the brand owners would say. Um, and I'm sure uh, that during the course of the debate, we'll be told just how many frequency members uh, some of these schemes have. I know Tim will be itching to share that figure with you. Uh, but, again, okay, fine, what's the point of a brand when information about all the hotels available is out there along with the means to book them? We have the transparency of the Internet. But there has to be a question. Do we have a liberation of information or a confusion of choice. Uh, playing in this, if we look at the consumer, we're intellectually lazy. We avoid hard questions where possible. Uh, we describe this as being cognitive misers. We look to save time and mental energy. Now, I'm afraid I'm going to engage with you again now, so probably we'll have another power issue. But stay with me. A bat and a ball together cost £1.10. The bat costs one pound more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? It's a quick, quick. 5p, very good. Uh, you've done a much better on that one. Most people do say 10p. Intuition says 10p. 5p is the correct answer. But you haven't been fed 5p as part of it, because for, for the bat to cost a pound more, it has to be 105 and the ball Five. But so many people, time and time again, two-thirds of people will ask that question, give the answer 10p. So you don't know your sector, you're quite good analysts. We're learning things this afternoon, so that's good. But the general principle is, we are cognitive misers, we do as little as we possibly can. Um, sort of system one, system two thinking is introduced by Daniel Kahneman for behavioral economics. So the brand, uh, we use it as a mental shortcut. And, of course, that applies to owners and investors as well as to consumers. For them, it's a solution out of the box. 
And to the consumers, what's it doing? Well, elements of brand trust from work that we have done emphasize points of consistency, simplicity, and authenticity. That's what good brands deliver. They also deliver perceived added value. And a couple of years ago, we introduced the concept of brand margin that's now widely being used, the perceived financial premium that a brand name adds to the intrinsic value of a specific product or service. And it was at this event two years ago, it was introduced to the hotel sector, and I'm going to share with you some of the updated slides on that. This is when smartphones pop out, but it will be uh, available on the, uh, on the website. So this is looking at four tiers in the UK market, talking to UK guests, what do they consider to be the brand premium? That is, what is the premium that people would pay above the intrinsic value of an unbranded hotel? So it's the added value that the brand name brings. Um, and we're looking for four sectors, luxury, upper full service, mid-market, and economy. Um, clearly, not all brands are equal. We wouldn't expect them to be. If we look at the economy tier, um, we can see on average, a brand adds about five pounds of perceived value as far as the consumer is concerned. With Campanile as the lowest rated brand, while Hampton by Hilton continues to be the strongest performing brand uh, in this tier, uh, as we showed two years ago. In the mid-tier, uh, the range is from quality hotels, as before, though you've mapped brand premiums lift, lifted um, somewhat, through to AC uh, by Marriott, uh, a new entry um, at uh, over 15 pounds in terms of the, the value versus an unbranded equivalent. Moving on to upper full service, we actually have two leisure-oriented brands. So this is UK consumers not necessarily staying just in the UK. The Spanish leisure brand Iberostar adds nearly 17 pounds of brand value. Uh, the strongest performer is Disney Hotels at over 31. Now, one of the advantages of this methodology is it can cope with brands that don't necessarily have a large distribution. So when we look at the, the luxury segment, the lower end is anchored by Millennium, but they're still respectable 27 pounds, although no higher than many upper full service brands. But the potential value add goes all the way up to, uh, this time Mandarin Oriental has just moved ahead of the Waldorf Astoria at over 60 pounds. That's the most recent data we have for the UK. Um, well, well, how does this perceived added value of brands compare to the cost of flying their flag? Uh, well, here I'm indebted to uh, HVS and some analysis that they did in the US. This is from 2016. And so protecting the innocent, it's slightly historic data and it's not the UK market, but it's looking at a cross plot of the data that they gathered on the cost of brand affiliation um, in terms of franchise fees and associated costs versus uh, the brand margin data that we have available uh, in the US market. And clearly, there is a relationship between the two. On the whole, your brand, you get a bit more as far as the consumer is concerned if it's costing you a bit more uh, with regard to uh, the uh, brand owner. Um, but clearly, you can pick out the ones that are relatively strongly performing in this particular market. I've been told to hedge this with a lot of caveats. Um, but on this chart, uh, higher place clearly is, relatively speaking, the better performer, quality, the weaker one. Uh, that said, perceived value from a brand is only part of the story. I've said one of its benefits is it can take account of brands that are not particularly well known, but if you're not particularly well known, having a high brand value, a brand margin is only of limited use. So we have since taken that notion of brand margin, so the price premium a brand could command, and compared that with some other data that we collect on a regular basis, the extent to which consumers are familiar with the brand. And taking those two metrics, combining them, doing a bit of indexing, to produce an overall brand advantage score. Uh, and again, I know this chart will appear relatively small on the screens, and it does contain interesting data. This is the UK hotel brand advantage score summaries uh, for the most recent data that we have available. It shows that, though it may not have been the top ranked brand for brand margin, Hilton has the highest brand advantage, a perceived added value of about 25 pounds. Not the best in its market tier, but with the phenomenal reach of the Hilton name, this means that Hilton comes out as the number one ranked brand on this measure, and thus we could say it's the most powerful brand. Um, Premier Inn is placed second, 
Again, for an economy brand, its brand margin is average, but it has phenomenally high reach. Uh, Holiday Inn Express, interestingly, comes through in third place. Um, a higher brand margin than Premier Inn, but I'm not so far behind in terms of its reach, in terms of how familiar consumers are with it. So it comes through, perhaps, as a quite surprising entry into uh, the top uh, four or five brands. Then we have Marriott, uh, and then Holiday Inn itself. Um, and, and take the example of Holiday Inn. Its brand margin is actually low for its tier, and it's only a couple of pounds above Holiday Inn Express. But it is incredibly well known. So this gives it phenomenal impact uh, in the marketplace. And notice some of the, brand some of the brands with the highest brand margin, such as Disney and Hampton by Hilton, uh, they're on the list, but a bit lower down. Um, others, such as AC by Marriott, don't yet have the awareness in the market uh, to have achieved full impact. And if you look at the luxury tier, Mandarin Oriental had the highest brand margin, but because it's less well known, it's the Ritz-Carlton that comes through as the most powerful of the luxury tier brands. That's talking about the hotel brands a bit in isolation. Let's broaden it out and look at what is it that the consumer, what does the consumer really, really want? If I'd known what uh, David and Joe were going to be doing, I clearly would have had some music coming through at this particular point. Um, and I want to refer to a theory that's been around for sort of 10 to 15 years, uh, mainly in the US, uh, the theory of jobs to be done. Um, and this is something in the Harvard Business Review from this time last year. We've come to the conclusion that the focus on correlation and on knowing more and more about customers is taking firms in the wrong direction. What they really need to home in is the progress that the customer is trying to make in a given circumstance, what the customer hopes to accomplish. This is what we've come to call the job to be done. So the consumer has a job to be done. So that could be to book somewhere to stay for the night on my business trip to Dewsbury. Or it could be to arrange a fabulous weekend away with my, wa my mates somewhere out of town. Oh yes, and we'll need somewhere to sleep. Now, these may both involve a hotel booking, but they are very different jobs to be done. And the theory says that when we buy a product or service, in effect, we hire a solution for that job to be done. If it works, we'll likely hire that solution the next time we have a need for that job to be done. If it doesn't, we'll fire it and we'll hire a different solution. And Alan Clement in his uh, book about when coffee and kale compete, so this is talking about when apparently very different products can meet the same underlying need, uh, and he says that people are looking for the principle of self-betterment. Consumers want to change existing situations to preferred ones. Now, I'm providing this as a preface to the final section of the charts I'm going to share. Because I say OTAs are brands as well. And are they just doing a better job? That's a question for the panel to consider. This is looking at the market penetration for digital hotel reservations for our most recent data. Well, Booking.com is the big daddy, uh, or should I say the Amazon uh, of the sector, uh, with Expedia also a major force. That said, there is some evidence of the fight back by the hotel brands, with now five of them in the top 12. When my colleague Jane shared some data uh, similarly for leisure travelers, this is all travelers, business and leisure here, um, there were only two in the top 10. But we do have to ask, are the leading OTAs simply better at the digital customer journey? The best digital brands from whatever business sector are engaged in continuous programs of live market testing and laboratory customer interaction. Now, we've been very pleased to work with a number of uh, hotel brands uh, with their websites, looking to get them to improve uh, the conversion rates and the navigation through them. And then two or three year, years later, they come back and ask us to do it again. The leaders in this sector are doing it all the time. It's a non-stop commitment. Uh, we happen to be working with a big um, UK bank. Happens to be one that uh, David referred to. They're moving to Birmingham shortly, their UK base. We're doing work every month with them, doing rapid turnarounds, and there's a queue of people wanting to get their bit in, in which they're improving the digital experience. That is what the market leaders are doing. That is the price you have to pay if you want to keep pace. And then the final uh, data slide I've got is, you know, has the home share sector just tapped in better to the desired customer experience, to that job that needs to be done? People have used hotels because it was what was available. It was a solution available to them. Uh, but home share is providing a new solution. And 
Yeah, very impressive statistics have just been shared uh, from CBRE, but Airbnb flat out as bookings rose by 81% year on year. Uh, you may have read this last month. 168,000 listings in the UK, six million guests, three quarters of a million from the US, quarter of a million from France, 20 million room nights. Just doing a little bit of mental arithmetic on that. That's the demand for about 75,000 hotel rooms. Uh, hang on, hang on, I understand. Not everyone staying in an Airbnb would have stayed in a hotel. At BDRC, we've been running customer diaries, understanding what people have done, and on occasions where they've stayed with Airbnb, we've asked them, what would you have done instead had that not been available? It varies from market to market, but around a quarter of the demand that is going to Airbnb has come from what otherwise would have gone to the branded hotel sector. So what does that imply? Around about 20,000 hotel rooms not being sold every night because that demand is staying elsewhere. I just imagine how spectacular uh, those RevPAR statistics would have been um, if that Airbnb a competition hadn't been there. And again, I also understand that Airbnb is growing the total market as well by providing a new solution. So to conclude, before I hand over to the panel, we're in what we call Red Queen hypothesis territory. So from Alice uh, through the looking glass, um, now here you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. And I think that's the principle of what we're at, and that's what I was talking about uh, with the testing that you need to do on digital channels. The brand must assume responsibility for product and service innovation. And I believe that this is why new hotel brands are not just relevant, they are essential. Mature brands, likewise, have to be reimagined to retain relevance. But for now, over to the panel, who will be introduced by Alistair McCutcheon of JLL. Thank you very much.